Thank you so much, Patricia. This is Darren Mitchell. I'm a consultant to the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges um, and other national organizations on a variety of issues around domestic violence um, with a keen interest in firearms and domestic violence, which is a topic I've been working on for about 19 years now. And I'm so excited. I know I share this with my um, co-presenters today. So excited to have you all joining us to talk about judicial leadership in the context of firearms uh, and domestic violence cases. Um, before we begin, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to introduce themselves. I just want to note that we're at a, a couple of stages um, during today's uh, presentation. We're going we're gonna to try to open up the phone lines, lines to um, solicit input from you in terms of challenges you're facing or um, some strategies that you, that you yourselves employ or you know of. And we really um, welcome your input. Uh, try to make this as conversational as possible. Uh, we're going to give that a go with unmuting folks, and if that doesn't work, we'll have to resort to the chat box, but, um, but we're hoping we can have a conversation going. So without further ado, let me turn it over to my colleague, Judge Susan Carbon. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sue Carbon, and I am a family court judge in New Hampshire. I've been on the bench for about 25 years, and I've spent a lot of that time working with Darren and others on firearms issues. Um, I spent a couple of years at the Office on Violence Against Women as the director a number of years ago, and have also been a past president of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and I'm really pleased that the council is sponsoring this webinar here so that we can all share and learn from one another about judicial leadership in firearms. So thank you for being on the call this afternoon. And hello, everybody. My name is Judge Rob Kanyas. I'm a, the presiding judge of County Criminal Court Number 10 in Dallas, Texas. My court it handles only domestic violence criminal cases, and I've been on the bench now for 11 and a half years. Um, back in 2013, the U.S. Department of Justice named my court a domestic violence mentor court, one of only three in, in the country at that time. Now there are 10. Um, for and it means that we that we exhibit uh, best practices when it comes to domestic violence cases. About three years ago, I started Dallas County's first ever uh, firearm surrender program, and so I'm really excited about this webinar, and I'm happy to uh, share what I've learned with everybody on the call today. And uh, so this this presentation is done in collaboration with uh, the Nancy. National Council on Juvenile and Family Court Judges, the Center for Court Innovation, and the Judicial Engagement Network. I want to take a second to tell you about the Judicial Engagement Network because it is uh, still fairly new. It's about a little over two years old, and it's uh, made up of judges who have taken leadership roles in their own communities on the issue of domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, both Judge Carbon and I are founding members of the Judicial Engagement Network. And the real goal of it is to provide judges around the country with the most uh, cutting edge, the best tools, the most up-to-date experiences of what we've been working on when it comes to domestic violence and sexual assault. Our motto is strong families and safer communities, and, and we really are working to uphold that motto. So uh, I really would encourage every, everybody on the call to check us out after the webinar, um, and because I, I think it will become a useful tool for you as we go forward. Great. So in case you, whoops, somehow we, all right, whoops, sorry. On the uh, bottom of the Judicial Engagement Network, you'll see the website for that. So I really encourage everybody to check that out. Um, this afternoon, I want to begin by identifying the learning objectives that we've uh, established for this particular webinar. And as the title of the webinar indicates, our primary goal is to help you learn how you can take a leadership role both from the bench and beyond, so with the bench and then within the community, in promoting community safety in domestic violence cases that involve firearms. And to do this, one of the most effective ways is to engage with community collaboration. So we'll be talking about how collaboration can enhance victim safety and community well-being, so taking it at a, a broader perspective. We're also going to be identifying some opportunities for courts and communities to use existing laws that we have. We're not talking about judges creating law or 
being the policy developers, but what we're talking about are taking existing resources that we have and how can we use those to prevent abusers' access to firearms both in civil cases and in criminal cases. And you'll see throughout the webinar uh, this afternoon, Rob and I are going to uh, piggyback back and forth between some civil and criminal issues here. And then our fourth goal is to identify some effective strategies from jurisdictions around the country. And Darren a moment ago said that we're going to be opening up for some conversation with all of you. This will be a chance for you to uh, pipe in and let us know about some exciting things that are going on in your own jurisdictions. And finally, our fifth goal for this afternoon is to identify how you can use or make a better use of the existing laws, policies, protocols, and forms that you have or that you'll learn about today to improve your own court practice. We want to make all of us better judges in the work that we do, so we think that the webinar is designed to help you do that. So Terrific. We wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the topic, both in terms of why it's so important for us to be having this conversation about what judges can do um, to help better implement the, the existing laws and, and um, prevent abusers from having access to firearms, um, as well as the legal framework for all this. So let's first talk about this public health problem. That's really um, the main reason we're, we're talking about this is because we've learned over the years through research, many of you know the work of, ja of Dr. Jacqueline Campbell of Johns Hopkins University around uh, lethality factors, um, predictors of uh, intimate partner homicide in domestic violence and in intimate partner um, violence situations, and the access to guns, not ownership of guns, uh, not possession of guns, access to guns is the single greatest risk factor that Jackie's research has revealed. Um, compared to homes where there is no gun, the mere presence of a firearm makes it eight times more likely that there will be a homicide in that, in that house if the offender is a, an intimate partner of the victim. And it, that jumps up to 20-fold, according to this research, where there is a prior history of domestic violence um, in the household as well. So it's a huge risk factor, and just the mere access to a gun can make the difference between um, violence and, and deadly violence. In addition, the reason we'd like to talk to, law, uh, to, to um, lawyer, uh, lawyers and judges about all of this is because the protection order process, and also there's some studies on criminal uh, prohibitions as well, um, but most of the research has been around the protection order process, that prohibitions that attach to civil protection orders can make a difference in protecting lives. And so we've learned through peer review research that if a court does order firearm surrender as part of a protection order, it is far more likely that the gun will actually be taken or surrendered by the abuser. Um, if you look at the the broader public health impact of protection order prohibitions against guns. It's shown that they reduce homicide and other violent crimes within the communities that have those protection order firearms prohibitions. There's also research showing that the reduction in homicide uh, by guns is not replaced by other homicides in communities where there are prohibitions against firearms access um, by abusers. So there's no substitution effect. The research indicates that abusers don't seek out other means of killing their intimate partners if there's no gun available. We do, of course, have copies of the research, summaries of the research available to any folks who would like them, think it would be helpful in your work or in working with your colleagues or others in your community uh, around in increasing uh, awareness of and enhanced response to firearms and domestic violence cases. We wanted to do a brief primer, a sort of overview or refresher for many of you on the federal, state, and tribal laws that address firearms and domestic violence. And as I'm sure most of you know, there are federal laws that specifically address DV. Um, and the, the two most important ones are the Gun Control Act and the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, the Brady Act, which prevents purchases of firearms. The Gun Control Act sets forth a series of um, of prohibited persons, folks who cannot have firearms in accordance with federal law. And um, in, the, in the 1990s, those were expanded to include domestic violence-specific uh, offenders. 
And so the first of those is uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 922G8 of the Gun Control Act, which says that a person who is subject to a qualifying protection order that has um, certain provisions um, and there are certain relationships involved, which we really don't have time to talk about today, but of course we can provide you lots of information on these topics. Um, those folks are prohibited under federal law from possessing a gun, from possessing ammunition. Uh, in addition to that, this law was expanded to include the, the, for the first time, folks who commit misdemeanors, and specifically domestic violence misdemeanors that they are convicted of, those convictions, provided they meet certain standards, prohibit the person from having a gun. So not just felons, but in the case of domestic violence crimes, misdemeanors are also prohibited from possessing or purchasing um, guns or ammunition. Finally, there's a provision around transfer. So if you knowingly transfer a firearm to someone who's federally prohibited under G8, G9, or any of the other uh, provisions of the Gun Control Act, or any uh, other laws that prohibit possession, um, you yourself could be federally prosecuted for knowing transfer under those circumstances. On the state side and the tribal side, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there is a very large range. The laws vary significantly across the country. The common themes are that many states and tribes have um, attached domestic violence um, firearm prohibitions to civil protection orders, to misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence, as does the federal law, and also laws in many states um, and some tribes address law enforcement's authority to remove firearms at the scene of a domestic violence offense. To give you a very brief overview of what this looks like, I have some maps. And you can see that a decent proportion of the country has explicit court authority to prohibit possession or purchase of firearms upon issuance of certain forms of protection orders. Uh, and this, this map may not be 100% accurate. It's actually as of a couple years ago, and there's been a little bit of legislative activity. But it gives you a sense that throughout the country, there are many states that have such provisions. Um, in addition to that, fewer states have specific provisions around ordering surrender if you are subject to a civil protection order. So judges in those jurisdictions can say, upon issuance of a civil protection order, you must surrender your weapons. Um, and we'll talk about that in a lot of detail in just a few minutes. In many places, it's discretionary. And in some places, those, pro those orders to surrender are mandatory as part of it. In some instances, issue of ex issuance of ex parte orders, and in other instances, um, issuance of the final protection order. On the criminal side, there are many states that have prohibitions that attach when someone has been convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence. You get an indication of this here. And in addition, I don't have a map, but there are a smaller number of states that prohibit um, or that, that specifically authorize law enforcement to take weapons at the scene of the domestic violence offense under a variety of different standards and subject to a variety of different requirements. We wanted to touch on, finally, the Brady Act that I mentioned earlier, because it is such a powerful law in that it prohibits folks who are prohibited under those provisions of the law we just talked about, whether they're state, tribal, or um, federal prohibitions, from purchasing guns. And of course, the Brady Act um, provides for the FBI to do a background check. And there's some complication around there, because in some instances, it's the state that does the check. But in general, a background check must be done in reference to a series of databases that are laid out here that contain certain types of information, including um, the NCIC, which, which has information about protection orders that will subject someone um, to a prohibition. The triple I, which will have criminal history records, including, hopefully, all the misdemeanor, cr misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence that are prohibit prohibitors under the federal law. And also the NICS index, which is the National Instant Criminal Background Check System's own index, in which some protection orders that can't get into the uh, more stringent NCIC um, can be in there and available for, to stop purchases um, upon a criminal history check. So that's a very brief overview, a reminder for folks who already know this about some of the legal, uh, the legal framework for doing this work. And now what we're going to do is talk a little bit about um, specifically the work that, that Judges um, Carbon and Kanyas have done and some other ideas from around the country. So I'm going to start off by asking Judge Carbon what you perceive to be some of the key challenges in preventing abusers from accessing firearms, specifically in civil protection order cases. Okay. 
there are an awful lot of challenges in this area. And I think if we remember that the theme that Darren mentioned a few moments ago, that the research shows that court-ordered firearm surrender actually gets guns out of the hands, how is it then that we can learn what those firearms are? So to me, the most fundamental challenge is learning whether there are firearms. So you can't prevent someone's access to firearms if you don't know if there are any, what firearms exist, and where they would be. So that's just a fundamental foundational issue that for many, many judges and many communities uh, is the biggest challenge there is. If you kind of think of it in a baseball analogy, you can't score until you've gotten up to the plate and gotten to first base. So to me, knowing about the guns is the biggest challenge. Uh, second one is monitoring compliance. But let's come back to the lack of information and learning about the firearms. I think all of us have experienced working with victims who come to court and complete a petition, but who really have no idea if the abuser has got any firearms. There may have been a threat to use a gun, but he or she may never have seen a firearm. Uh, they sometimes don't know anything more about a gun than they've seen a gun, but they can't describe it any more than, well, it was something I put in my hand or you know, a handgun size or it's a long gun, but no other detail about that. Um, they don't know where an offender might hold the firearms. They don't know if relatives have them, if they've been given to third parties, uh, or if it's somewhere in the home that they live in together. So this basic lack of information is palpable. Um, then, of course, they're incredibly easy to obtain other new guns, even if some have been surrendered. We all know about third-party purchases that don't need to go through a federal check, um, gun sale loopholes and all of this sort of thing. So lots of opportunity to have a need for finding out access uh, about the firearms. Kind of a bigger bucket of challenges around protection orders is actually monitoring compliance with an order that we may issue to surrender or to not possess firearms. Um, the statutes, as the previous slides indicated, are different. So there are some jurisdictions where you actually have an affirmative requirement for an offender to surrender. Sometimes it's permissive and sometimes there's no legislation at all. So it's difficult to monitor what we don't know. And if we don't know if there are guns, that's the first challenge. How do we monitor that? So how do we find out if guns have been surrendered? What kind of forms might be used that would be helpful to track any guns that have been surrendered? Are we looking at asking offenders to sign an affidavit? What are we expecting from law enforcement to help us out? Sometimes we have challenges even getting orders served, let alone getting firearms uh, taken upon service of the gun. So this monitoring compliance is really a loop back to the court. It's part of our own challenge as judges for us to be accountable for our own orders. So we issue an order. When we're talking about ensuring that our orders are being followed, we need to take accountability for that and develop some strategies so that we're going to be able to learn how we can more effectively monitor firearms. Thank you, Sue. And we're going to, we're going to come right back and talk about that um, in a little more detail in just a couple more minutes. And I'm, for now, we're going to turn back to um, Judge Kanyas and ask you on the criminal side in criminal domestic violence cases, what do you perceive to be some of the key challenges in preventing abusers' access to guns? Well, I would, uh, I would far, first start at, uh, on the point that Sue, Sue, Sue made, and that is uh, knowing how, how do you know if there are guns even involved in your case. You know, um, we're different. Criminal courts have the added problem um, in that as compared to like a protective order case where you have a victim there in court asking the court to do something, many times in a criminal case, the victim doesn't want any part of that, of that case. They don't want to cooperate with the court. They don't want to cooperate with prosecutors. They, don't, they, they just don't want to be part of the system. So, you know, how would a court know? And, and oftentimes, as everybody knows, the prosecutors will still go forward with the case, and so it's still relevant to consider at, at a, a, a bond condition of no firearms, what have you, 
you know, how is the court to know if guns are even involved if you don't even have the victim's cooperation? So that's one extra challenge that criminal courts have. Um, police officers are generally very good uh, of picking up firearms when they are used as part of the offense. But as misdemeanor cases, uh, at least in Texas, um, you can have a misdemeanor domestic violence case uh, and the weapon won't be involved because then that would make it a felony. And so police officers aren't very good at just notating in their general probable cause affidavit or any documentation that they file along with the case that, hey, when we were there, we saw a pistol laying down in the bedroom or something like that. So. Uh, it, police officers don't normally notate the presence of firearms in the home uh, unless those firearms were used in um, the offense itself. And um, so there's a general problem or challenge of just the system as a whole getting that information. But of course, judges, you know, if the prosecutor doesn't tell us or, or the defense attorney doesn't bring it up, um, you know, how are we as judges supposed to get that information ourselves? I've spoken with judges across the country, and some have access to probable cause affidavits like I do, uh, police reports, things like that. But there are many judges that don't have access to that. They just have the case in front of them, and they just know what the, what the lawyers are telling them. Um, there could also be a delay in the case filing. Uh, it's one of the things that we're experiencing in Dallas right now. An offense, a 911 call may go out on day one, but it may not be till day 30 until the police actually file the case. Uh, you know, detectives have to get involved. They have to try to make contact with both sides to try to get statements, so on and so on. And that delay in the case, especially when we're talking about an allegation of violence, of violence um, and, you know, the, the sooner a court can get involved with uh, orders uh, prohibiting firearms, the safer everybody will be. But if the police need time to make their cases, the further that time grows, the less effective um, in terms of safety your orders are going to be. Um, there can also be gaps in the enforcement of orders, um, especially in big urban uh, locations like Dallas. Uh, one of the issues we have is uh, a magistrate judge might will order an offender to dispossess himself of a firearm when he's about to be released from the jail, uh, but that magistrate doesn't have the, any enforcement mechanism. I, when I see that person two or three weeks later, uh, I can then begin an enforcement process, but there's been a delay. And so if you're in a jurisdiction like that or uh, if you haven't um, – noticed any gap or haven't paid attention to any gap, that'd be one thing to look at. Um, also, there can be, in a criminal case, there can be a lot of people touching that case before a judge gets it. I'll talk about how that can actually be a good thing, but, right, but it can also be a challenge because if you have, you'll have investigators, you'll have the police at the scene, you'll have the prosecutors, both in the intake prosecutors and the prosecutors who actually handle the case, You'll have a lot of people who will touch that case, and, and that means a lot of ways where guns can be overlooked or the information just doesn't get moved on, um, nobody asks the question, things of that nature. So you, when you have more, more fingers in the pie, it can be a challenge in making sure that the information is going to get to the people who need to make the decision. And then uh, every once in a while, I'll also run into folks who will say that either the Second Amendment or the Fifth Amendment uh, apply in these types of cases. And I think, like Sue said earlier, we're not talking about making extra laws as, as judges. We're just talking about using the laws that we, that we have on the books already. And while we, um, we don't have time in this webinar to talk about how the Supreme Court has come down on Section 922G8 and and has upheld it every time that they've talked about it. They even expanded the mental culpability uh, a year or two ago. So the Supreme Court has ruled that constitutional. Um, and so the Second Amendment doesn't really apply. The Fifth Amendment, I, I've talked with judges about, you know, can judges even question a criminal defendant about guns? Um, and uh, there's Supreme Court cases out there that, that say, how, you know, the Fifth Amendment only applies when and if the prosecutors are going to use any information 
given that was compelled against that person. And so a judge asking a defendant, sir, do you have, do you have guns in the home, um, is not where the Fifth Amendment comes in. It would come in if it even comes in at all if the state were trying to use that information to prosecute. Um, and so, uh, so just be aware of that, uh, that that issue can come up from time to time. Thank you, Judge Kanyas. Um, so now we're going to talk about some specific strategies uh, that may be uh, available to overcome some of the challenges that uh, both of our judges have just discussed. And I'm going to start by turning it over uh, to Judge Carvin to talk about, on the civil protection order side, some of the strategies that she uses or is aware of. Oops, sorry. All righty. So I want to tie the strategies back to the challenges that we identified earlier. And that is, uh, in my book, the two biggest ones are learning about the firearms and access to firearms, and then how we monitor compliance. So before I do that, I'd like to just cover a couple of what we believe to be some real key elements in an effective protection order system. And those of you who are doing protection orders will recognize these kinds of stages and the importance. But the first, again, is the basic need, the foundational need to get information about the guns. And we've talked about that as a challenge before. But that then feeds into, once we've got information, we need to issue a clear and an enforceable surrender order. And there are a lot of strategies around how we can do that. Um, and again, as we've said many times, we don't have enough time to go through all of the information around many of these topics, but that's a second area to focus on. That feeds then into the third area, which is ensuring that the parties understand the terms and the conditions of the order and what their obligations are under the order. It does absolutely no good if we issue what we believe to be a rock solid order that we understand, but the parties don't understand, because we can't get to community safety and victim safety and offender accountability if they don't know what they're expected to do. So another area of an effective protection order system is service of process. And this really has two separate prongs to it. The first is you can't enforce an order that hasn't yet, well, with some exceptions, you can't enforce an order that hasn't been served. The defendant needs to know that there's an order and that he has an obligation to surrender. Um, so getting orders served can be, in some jurisdictions, a big challenge. But it's got to be served for us to have an effective protection order system. But secondly, service of process gives us, gives law enforcement, a real significant opportunity to obtain firearms that maybe they have not yet already obtained. Um, so when they go to a home or to a business or on the street and they're serving the order, actually taking guns at that time can be one of the most effective ways to promote community safety. Once we've got the guns, then we need to roll into our fifth component, which is monitoring compliance, and we'll get into that in a second, to ensure that our order is actually being followed. And then finally, the safe and effective returns process, which is a whole uh, bigger area to talk about as well. But I want to come back and focus on the first element of this, which is actually getting the information, learning what we've got. One particular area and focusing on collaboration is working with your advocates in your community to have them, in turn, work with victims to question them through interview guides or questionnaires to actually get information about the firearms. They can sit down with them, walk them through a template of questions to get information. Sometimes court staff can do this, um, but it's a way for them to help guide a conversation to obtain information that's necessary from the victim about what firearms may exist. So that's with advocates. A second way is through the petitions that we have in court, either whether it's the petition for a protective order or some jurisdictions have a separate motion that a petitioner would file to ask the defendant to surrender his or her firearms. So the, in most jurisdictions, if you look at the protection order itself, there's space on the form to fill in what you know about the firearms and to request that they be surrendered. Some jurisdictions also have supplemental forms that they use, and this gives you opportunity to explain more information about the guns, more detail about what guns exist, where they might be located, who last had them, where they were seen, and so forth. Um, also an opportunity to describe 
what the guns are. And this leads us to the informational brochures. This can really help folks identify or describe the gun more than just saying, well, it's a big, long gun, uh, or something they use for hunting, or it's a handgun, because there are a lot of variations and a lot more specific information that could be helpful for law enforcement when they're attempting to retrieve firearms if they are not surrendered directly by the defendant. Another great way that um, Rob touched upon are on the law enforcement incident reports. So when law enforcement goes to a scene, they make an arrest, and they write this up, or they show up at a civil protection order um, an event, or they're responding to a call for help. If they write up an incident report, they may be doing an on-scene inventory of firearms that they've observed or access to, or that they are interviewing defendants about themselves. So getting information directly from the offender is another terrific way to get that information. Something else that Rob talked about a moment ago were actually your civil and criminal court records. As he mentioned, in some jurisdictions, judges only have access to the file in front of them. But you may be in a system, whether they're in your courthouse or statewide, where you can retrieve information from other court records. Now, some jurisdictions permit this. Some have doubts about the extent to which a judge can access other information. But it's something for you to look into cross-referencing your files and accessing information that may be present in other cases that are presently ongoing with the particular parties. Another way to access information is through training. And this can be training of court staff, training of advocates, training of law enforcement, training of judges to ask questions. Basic, ask questions. And if we're not asking questions or we don't have the presence of mind to ask questions, we may not be getting necessary information that would otherwise be readily available, but for the fact that nobody thought to ask. And then finally, make sure that you've got appropriate access, language access, for all the many people who come into your court. Some of us are in courts where we've got folks who speak up to 100 different languages. So you've got to make sure that when people come to court, you've got somebody who can work with them, who can help them understand the process, help them understand the language, uh, help them feel comfortable understanding that in our world, it is OK to ask for a firearm to be surrendered. Some people may be very uncomfortable asking about that or may not understand that it is truly permissible uh, and may not understand the implications to their own relationship by doing that. So I'm going to turn to Darren for a second to give you a couple of great examples that we've called from around the country. Yes, and this will be just an overview. To the extent you're interested in getting um, these forms themselves or to having conversations around other models we have for getting information from uh, petitioners, from others in the system, law enforcement, uh, we'd be happy to have those conversations and share the information. But to give you a sense of some of the practices that we know of around the country that appear to be effective ways to get this information, in Wisconsin, a set of court, uh, mandatory court forms uh, mandatory use by the court, not mandatory by use of the parties, um, are available, including this optional form for petitioners, um, which is a statement of respondents' possession of guns. And it's an opportunity where if a petitioner is particularly concerned about the respondent's access to firearms, um, she or he could provide specific information about those guns and make a request to have them ordered surrendered under Wisconsin's Protection Order Code. And as you can see, there's a uh, kind of a matrix here where specific information about the guns, their makes and models, serial, number, serial numbers, and where they're located can be provided to the court to allow for specificity in any order to surrender issued by the court. Um, in uh, Miami, Dade County, uh, Florida, there is a form used called the Respondent Sworn Statement. And every respondent in a protection order case fills this out under penalties of perjury and indicates um, the, sta the status of firearms possession uh, by that person, including a listing of weapons that they may own. Um, in addition to that, um, and, and Judge Carbon referenced the fact that people may say, you know, it's a gun that would fit in my hand versus a long gun. Well, this SAFE tool was developed by the National Center on Protection Orders and Full Faith and Credit to enable a conversation between advocates 
and um, victims who are seeking protection orders or other, other forms of, uh, of relief or safety to have a conversation about guns. And so there are a bunch of questions included in the SAFE tool around firearms access and possession. And in addition to that, there is a pictorial guide to handguns and long guns so that more specific, specificity could be um, provided to the court and to law enforcement around what guns the, 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 uh, petition, uh, the, the respondent or other prohibited person may have access to, again, for specificity in, in ordering and ensuring that whatever guns were in possession are actually turned in. We're going to turn now to talking about the uh, next aspect mon that, that Judge Carbon is going to talk about, monitoring compliance with orders to surrender. Great. Thanks, Darren. So another major area of effective enforcement um, around firearms and within the context of civil protection orders is this bucket dealing with monitoring compliance. And we've identified five really effective strategies or components of an effective compliance monitoring system. So I'd like to just go through those. The first one, of course, is issuing an order that is clear, that includes specific deadlines and a description of the firearms. And to the extent that you have this information, that's great. You may be in a jurisdiction where there is no registration required. Somebody may not know what the firearms are, um, and so it may be a more generic. But the more detail you can give, the better you're going to have uh, being able to monitor the actual compliance. This turns in then to the second area, which are the instructions that we as judges are providing in our court orders to the defendants about where they go to turn in the firearms, what the process is, where they take them, what the time frame is for doing so, and then what type of proof we get back from the defendant and what comes back to the court. So all of this means that we need to be collaborating with law enforcement when we're doing this. We need to develop a system and a strategy that connects all of the dots together so that we're not having gaps between the systems. So ensuring that judges know what they need to do and that they're communicating that to defendants and to law enforcement if we're expecting law enforcement to give us a return form. So for example, in our state when we issue a protection order, along with that is a form instructing law enforcement to seize the firearms and then give us a return back when they give us a return that they have served the defendant. So we know exactly what firearms were taken which ones they are, where they got them from, and then they then hold them. So having some kind of receipt or an affidavit can be a very effective strategy to help you monitor the compliance. Rob mentioned before that we need to know who the key players are. You can't just have anybody at the PD or anybody in the courthouse following this stuff. You need people who are specifically designated so they know that that's their responsibility and they themselves are going to be monitoring compliance for their component of the work. So it's somebody who is familiar with the system, who knows what we need to be doing. And then, related to this, once we know that firearms have been surrendered, that we're uploading this into our statewide database so that law enforcement around the state and the victim would have access to this to know that the firearms have been surrendered as well. There's another area. dealing with a review mechanism, excuse me. And this is sort of the court's own internal accountability mechanism. And this involves courts actually having hearings, if we need them, to enforce our orders. So this means that we need direct communication between the court and the law enforcement agency that may have retrieved the firearms, or they report to us, or somehow through an affidavit, or any number of other strategies, we learn that firearms have not been surrendered as ordered. So we may schedule a hearing that could be canceled if we don't need it, but we require the respondent to give us some kind of proof of compliance. Sometimes it's directly on the respondent to show up to the courthouse or to the PD to surrender their firearms by a date certain. Sometimes they surrender them and then they have to provide proof to us. So they get a statement from law enforcement, here are all the guns I surrendered, and they file that back with the court. We know that that's happened. And if, in fact, the guns have not been surrendered or they've not provided their proof of compliance, we have a mechanism in place that can address their noncompliance. 
So this, again, will depend upon what your own state law will provide for, but it may be that you have the authority to issue a search warrant or an arrest warrant for noncompliance. You could have a show cause or a contempt hearing if they're not compliant. And then finally, it also gives the prosecutor another tool in his or her toolbox to charge the offender with a violation of a protection order, which takes you from the civil arena into a criminal arena because they've now violated, and that can be a, a criminal offense related to the protection order. But all of this creates meaningful access to justice for the victim. And in the end of the day, that's what we want, a meaningful system that works for everybody. So Darren, again, is going to give you a couple of great examples of what we've seen around the country. Yes, here's some forms from a, a couple of different communities. And in, uh, in Oregon, the, uh, the form that's used to achieve one of the goals that Judge Carbon just laid out, um, indication on the part of the um, respondent that there was compliance with any order to surrender for the monitoring piece. Um, this is what a, a, um, a respondent would, uh, would file with the court, including an, a copy of a receipt if the um, ammunition or firearms have been surrendered to law enforcement. So they develop the receipt to that law enforcement provides um, to the respondent. So they can check off that they've surrendered it, that they've given it to a third party, and there's actually a third party affidavit that must be signed under those circumstances, or that they don't have firearms or ammunition to turn in. In uh, Washington State, there are, they use a couple of uh, forms that are um, that need to be turned into the court around either surrender or non-surrender of firearms. You fill in the surrender order if you've done so. Uh, the Washington state law is clear as to who you can, whom you can turn it into. It needs, either needs to be a, a law enforcement agency or a specified by the court third party or an attorney. And so this form indicates compliance with that. Or if you don't have guns, um, you indicate, you sign under penalty of perjury that I don't have any guns, um, so I had nothing to surrender. Uh, in uh, an another Wisconsin form to show you, and this is one of those receipts that I referred to earlier in the, ca in the uh, instance of Oregon. That th this is one that's used in Wisconsin that's a little different. And law enforcement, if, a, um, if guns, ammunition are turned in to the agency, this receipt is provided to the uh, respondent who then would turn this into the, uh, the court. And in fact, in some places, the communication can be directly from the law enforcement agency to the court. And some judges will issue a show cause order or, or sometimes a bench warrant if a receipt is not um, returned from law enforcement or by the um, respondent within the period of time that, uh, that was required. Finally, um, this is a form that's used as a show cause order in, um, in Florida, in, again, Miami-Dade County. If the court learns that guns were not turned in because no proof of surrender has been sent to the, to the court within the 24 hours required, um, then the judge immediately issues a show cause warrant, and there'll be a contempt hearing um, and further action if the guns are not turned in. So just some examples of how forms can be used for this process of compliance monitoring. There are many other examples. We've done a lot of thinking around this issue and worked with folks in many communities about how to improve their compliance monitoring processes, and we're very happy to share that information and have conversations with you as well. So now what I'm going to do is turn it over to you all, and, we're, and as I mentioned earlier, we're going to try to unmute the phones. Um, hopefully, if you want to participate, you need to do it um, via telephone, and so the 800 number to call in, it's an easy process and get connected is there, or alternatively, we're perfectly happy to take any um, examples you want to share or any questions you have about what we've discussed so far using the chat feature on the, the chat box. You'll see it says chat to everyone. Um, there's a little um, space in which to type your comments and then a little sort of speech bubble that you can click on in order to um, have your chat show up, your chat comment show up for everyone to see. So if it's okay, Patricia, can we open up the phone lines and see if anyone has anything to add to the conversation? Yeah, of course. Let me go ahead and unmute everyone now. Um, just a reminder, if you are not presently speaking, we do ask that you mute your own phone lines just to eliminate any background noise that might come through. folks just a second to see if they can uh, call in and chat. And if not, we'll, we'll move on. And again, uh, we're happy if, if 
folks have any comments or questions uh, on the fly while we're talking, please feel free to chat in, and, um, and we'll address those as soon as we can. I have a question. Yes, Judge Kanye. This is uh, Mason Simons, uh, oh. Elko, Nevada. And, oh, hi, uh, Simons. Uh, a quick question for you. Uh, you know, Nevada just recently adopted a new state law that <clears throat> on, upon conviction of a misdemeanor DV case that the court shall order the surrender, the permanent surrender of the firearms. <clears throat> and what we see a lot in our court is, beef, you know, the you know perhaps the case has been negotiated, they're scheduled for a, a change of plea hearing or something like that. Before they ever get to court, they've already transferred those firearms to someone else. So they'll come into court and say, Judge, uh, you know, my, my client, uh, Bob Jones, has uh, already, uh, already transferred these firearms to his, his parents or his brother or whatever, and then they'll sign an affidavit saying that they no longer possess any firearms. So one of the concerns that this often causes for me is the question in my mind about whether or not these potentially are just sham transfers, that they're not really permanent transfers of the firearms as required by state law. And so I don't know if you guys have any strategies for avoiding these sort of, you know, these sort of sham transfers that might go on where a person fully intends on getting their firearms back. Um, you know, is there any strategies that you guys have seen used around the country to sort of avoid that problem? We, well, we have, um, you know, let's have Judge Kanye's answer first because I think he uses something in Dallas and I can share some other examples. Yeah, we often get requests for third-party transfers and oftentimes, uh, what I, what we require is uh, for the offender to bring in the third party into court, and I will um, I will inform the third party of exactly what the court order was is, and then go ahead and and inform the third party of the legal obligations that surround transfers. Like Darren mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, that by transferring a firearm, you you become criminally liable. Um, and so, you know, in just informing the third party as to those prohibitions. Um, and then also, you know, somewhere in the system we'll find out, you know, it's, it might be to mama or to dad, but, you know, an offender is still living with them. You know, every jurisdiction is going to be a little different, but, uh, you know, whether or not it's in terms of a judge has an approval uh, ability to say, I'm sorry, you know, that I'm not going to approve that, even though it might have already happened. And so that might be something to look into. But our experience has been that once we start require, once we started requiring third parties to come to court, a lot of third parties are like, uh, no, I'm not going to do that, you know, and then, the, and then, then we're, we can go back to the, the gun going to a law enforcement agency. Thank you, Judge, Carney. Judge Carbon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would say the same holds true in a civil context. People may say, oh, I gave my gun to grandma. Well, we know that grandma doesn't even know what a gun is, let alone what to do with it. So um, we instruct them the same thing. If you've handed it to her, that's constructive possession because, in effect, the offender has access to the gun. Um, so we require the grandmother or whoever, the third party, uh, to come in and make them aware that they're subject to these restrictions. If the offender is living in the home, um, then that's access, and we don't permit that. So. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, you just need to call them on it um, and make sure that they understand the implications of allowing access to a gun. The only thing I would add is that there are some forms um, that are available on around this third-party transfer and um, prevention of constructive possession or access to weapons um, that we'd be very happy to share with you. There are a few places around the country that have developed these forms, and they require them to be um, signed by both the um, prohibited person and by the third party. And, of course, the practice of bringing them before court is, is, a, is the best practice that we'd love to see all jurisdictions um, use as well. There have been some uh, prosecutions for constructive possession of firearms, too, and so that's a real uh, legal liability that's out there for folks. I hope that answered um, your question or at least gave you some ideas. Please do follow up. We'll have some contact information at the end of the slide and can share uh, more with you, Judge Simon. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I think we will move on. I see um, that someone is typing, and we'll, we, we can we can jump to that in just a minute. But we're gonna let's let's move on and talk about the next topic. And please, if you were typing in, please do continue. We're happy to try to answer any questions you have, or would love to hear your comments. Um, but we're going to move on now to uh, the criminal side, and Judge Conius is going to discuss with us some uh, additional strategies around criminal process. You know, I won't, be, I won't belabor a lot of what Sue said because a lot of what she said, especially about compliance hearings, uh, definitely applies on the criminal side. I would, just, I would just add these things, and that is that it really needs to become second nature in whatever system you're working in. If you see domestic violence, those words in your pleadings, in the probable cause affidavit, what, what have you, the first thought you ought to be having is firearms. And everybody in the system ought to be trained that way to think about, to think about firearms. It really just needs to become second nature. Um, talking about the in-person uh, hearings, whether it's you're admonishing the offender or you're admonishing a third party, Try to do that as early as possible. The, earliest, the earlier the court can intervene and issue an order, the more safety you can bring to the situation. I like to think of it as maintaining the status quo, you know, and presenting it to the offender that way um, and because you're just trying to keep everybody safe until you can come to some adjudication in the, in the case. And it really, it really ought to be done in person by the judge. I think what we found in Dallas is that we've had judges who tried to just do admonishments via a document, um, and you do need it in writing for sure, but to follow it up with the judge actually admonishing the person about what the legal liabilities are, what the order means, can go much further and have much more effect. I'm not so naive to think that people don't lie to judges, but um, I do feel that by looking, if you're looking someone in the eye who's wearing a black robe, you're gonna, you're, it's going to be a little tougher. Um, and then um, I, I mentioned earlier about making the fact that you have a lot of players in the system an advantage. This gives you a lot of ways, instead of thinking it as more ways for the information to get lost or not to move up, think of it as more points to gather the information. And then, of course, thinking about using all the players as a way to continuously ask the question. Because when I talk to judges, I always, have, I always want to remind folks that you're not just asking the question, do you have guns, once. You're asking it throughout the case, as long as that case is active, because we know that people can acquire guns at any point, and you don't have to look far to find tragedies where maybe the guy didn't have a gun at the beginning, but he acquired it somewhere during the process, and then something bad happened. So it just needs to become second nature, and the question just needs to be continuously asked. And that's what I would add to what Sue said earlier. Thank you, Judge Kanyas. And I just wanted to point out a couple more um, strategies around criminal domestic violence cases, and that has to do with um, some of the pretrial um, stuff that happens, um, the issuance of pretrial orders, um, bail, bond, con and conditions of release orders, uh, uh, as well as the plea, plea bargain process. And just want to point out that, um, as Judge Kanye has already talked about, that asking the question um, and incorporating, co incorporating issue um, information about firearms ownership or access into, um, into what the court issues in terms of pretrial orders whether the in information comes from probation or court services, if you have them, uh, um, into the, the bail recommendation report that's written, um, whether prosecutors can investigate pro firearms issues and then seek that relief as part of um, a, a, as the pretrial order. That can be a, an effective practice. And of course, judicial officers, um, if they get that information, do have at their disposal legal authority to issue um, bail orders and conditions of release, criminal no contact orders, et cetera, that specifically prohibit firearms possession. Those orders can be um, themselves, of course, um, can, can uh, result in criminal violations if they're, if they're violated. In addition, they can support stopping purchases of guns in some instances and things like that. So um, very important strategies to think about. Uh, I wanted to point out an example of, um, from Illinois in which uh, the court in a criminal case is able to issue a supplemental order when they put, uh, can, uh, when there's a bond and there's conditions on that bond that specifically address firearms. So this is an example that requires that um, weapons be surrendered 
by the criminal defendant in a case um, by a certain time and at a certain place, which is uh, an effective strategy for, um, for addressing this issue in criminal cases. In addition, just to be aware of, um, and I know many of you already are, the impact of pretrial negotiations and plea agreements on prohibitions that are out there, both state, tribal, and federal prohibitions that may not come into effect once a, um, a case has been plead down to a lesser offense. And so it's really important for folks to, uh, to understand the impact of such plea bargains. And, um, and even for judges, um, even upon acceptance of such a plea or acceptance of a deferred prosecution, um, which of course I'm sure you know co goes by many names in many different places, but that deferral, that there won't be a prosecution or there won't be a conviction um, if the person promises and does not reoffend over the course of a year or whatever time is put in place, um, that even when you accept um, such things in a criminal case, you can order um, the surrender of, or at least um, order the, um, the the criminal, the offender, from uh, possessing, to refrain from possessing firearms. And those orders, those judicial orders, can of course, under state and federal law, in addition, um, provide more teeth um, require that there be surrender or, uh, or non-possession of firearms. Uh, an example of that is used in Indiana in which a court, um, in accepting a, an agreement to withhold prosecution or pretrial diversion under Indiana law, um, can order specifically using this court form um, that the defendant have no firearms, deadly weapons, or ammunition in his or her possession. Um, and so it's an effective tool to include a firearms uh, prohibition despite the fact that this case is being deferred or prosecution is being withheld. Um, and we're actually going to skip right on. Well, let's let's take a minute. I think we have, we do have a little bit of time. Um, if you want, you can try to you can try to um, call in again or use your chat. Any questions on the anything you've heard so far, including the criminal stuff that we just talked about? Okay, I think we'll move on again. Please feel free to chat in anytime. Um, and now we're going to shift to one of the things we promised we would talk about, which is judicial leadership. So I'd like to ask both of our judges, please, to talk a little bit about the role of judicial leadership, um, both in the successful development and implementation of all these kinds of strategies that we, um, that we just finished discussing here. And I'm going to start by asking uh, Judge Carbon to respond to this, please. Thanks, Darren. Um, when we're talking about judicial leadership, we focused a lot already, I think, on what judges can do in the courtroom in terms of ensuring that they're uh, gathering the necessary information, that they're issuing good orders, and uh, then monitoring the compliance. But I'd like to focus for a minute on what we can do as judges in the community, because we said we talk about on the bench and beyond. And I see a lot of the judicial leadership tasks that we have as those within the community. And I think we can use, let me focus, bump ahead here for a second. Um, we as judges can pick and choose issues that we want to focus on. In my view, this issue of firearms in domestic violence cases is one that is all about community safety. And as a judge, we have the opportunity to elevate this issue within our communities if we choose to. Judges are catalysts, we're conveners, People will respond if we convene a meeting. I, I think that's just so well known. And, but don't underestimate, for anybody, if you haven't done this, the potency of your position within the community. People look to judges because we have education, we have privilege. We should use that wisely. Um, we are the representatives of the third branch of government. So in my view, it's our responsibility to ensure that everybody has access to justice. This is not something that we can delegate our way out of. You know, we have to ensure that the public is getting the access that they need. And part of that access to justice means that we are helping to create safe communities. So it's important as a judge that not only do we convene folks together, but that we really have meaningful collaboration. And bringing folks together around firearms is one way to do this. We can help improve the processes in our court. 
we can improve the forms that we have. Judges can work not only with law enforcement and advocates, but we can work with U.S. attorney's offices and any number of other entities to ensure that we are helping to promote community safety by the effective use of the legislation that we have. I think we can also, and another reason why it is so important uh, for judges to take a leadership role is that we can make the courts welcoming to the public or we can, in a heartbeat, scare people away. And this gets to the topic of being trauma-informed. We need to make sure that we are welcoming in the courts, that everybody who somebody comes into contact with in the courts, everything from walking in the front door, going through security, to our clerk, to the judge inside the courtroom, that we are sensitive to what a victim may have experienced, the number of times that they may have told their story. We need to make this a welcoming environment where people are at ease giving us the information that we need so that, in fact, we can issue the orders that we need to issue. I want to make sure that people really understand that you've got to use your clout and your credibility in a wise and respectful manner. Don't waste it. Don't be flippant with it. Make sure that you are mindful of how folks perceive you and do your responsible job of making sure that you listen and you respect the opinions and views of those who come before you. And finally, make sure that you understand and that you demonstrate through your behavior that the court is a public institution. I have a real pet peeve about people saying, this doesn't happen in my courtroom. You know, it's not your courtroom. It's the public's courtroom. And this is uh, us as judges serving the public. They are our clients, and I think we need to make sure that we understand and we communicate that we are here to serve the public. And anything that we can do to make uh, our community safer through that service is something that we should be doing. So I'll let Rob comment in as well, because I know he's got lots of other thoughts about leadership here. OK. And um, so um, yeah, thank you, Sue. So the you know, I'm going to talk a little, uh, for, for a minute or two about collaboration, because you know, when it comes to gun surrender and, and gun safety, you know, judges just cannot do it alone. And, and I, I want to add one thing to what Sue said in terms of, you know, the ethics of judges doing this because, uh, you know, we, I think every jurisdiction allows judges to work on issues that are improvements of the law uh, by, by, by creating a safer environment for all parties to come to court. You're increasing access to the courts. Um, by uh, having considerations and asking the questions about guns, you're strengthening the, law, the laws uh, that keeps guns out of uh, the hands of people who shouldn't have them, and, and you're just making the process all so, so much more efficient. But like I said, when, when it comes to collaboration, you know, judges, we just can't do it alone. And so it, it, it's going to be necessary to work with others uh, in our respective systems um, to to get this done. And every jurisdiction is going to be a little different, right? I mean, uh, if you're in a rural jurisdiction, the people who have to be at that table are going to be different than in an urban. Uh, for us in Dallas, uh, you know, we had the federal prosecutors, ATF, we had state prosecutors, we had politicians, we had judges, we had law enforcement, uh, probation, just about everybody that you could think of that ought to be at a table talking about this issue was at that table. We were, we, were, we were lucky. We were fortunate. And we didn't get to that point overnight. It, that we were able to, when we first started our gun surrender program, we were able to really get going because we had already had time to develop our collaboration. And, um, and collaborate, you know, we, we're not going to have enough time on this webinar to actually talk about the nuts and bolts of how do you start to begin to collaborate, because I know that is an issue for many jurisdictions. But it can, it can start small and it, it can grow. And, uh, and, and, and so who are the key stakeholders? Well, like I, I mentioned a few, you know, if you're talking about having it uh, post-conviction, then you're definitely going to need probation on board. You're going to need prosecutors on board, so on and so on. Two of the people who should ought to be at, or two groups who ought to be at the table that I would encourage you not to overlook would be uh, the defense attorney community. Um, 
you know, when we first started, people were like, "Why wow, are the defense attorneys going to get on board? And and we weren't, uh, I guess I, I was a little surprised, but maybe I shouldn't have been. But the defense attorneys uh, have really been appreciative of our efforts because they want their clients to be compliant. They do not want their clients to get in any more trouble than they might already be in. They want their clients to be successful on probation they, and so on and so on. They want their day in court. And so defense attorneys have been very uh, a, a good partner with us. I'd also encourage you not to overlook the vic victim advocate community. I know as judges, it's uh, you know we can have some reservations about collaborating or being at a meeting with any advocacy group, um, but but to have the victim advocate community on board in some way can really help you grease the wheels as you grow your collaboration and as you move your program on. Um, just as a quick example, um, you know, when we started our, um, our program, and I'll move the slide here in a second so you can see exactly what I'm talking about, um, the, uh, we, we started by turning the guns over to a local business, a gun range. Um, it wasn't the ideal uh, it wasn't the ideal situation in terms of in, in, from the perspective of the victim advocacy community because part of our program when we first started was any guns that could never be returned to an offender would be given to the gun surrender to the gun range and they could put the gun back out into the marketplace. Uh, we had to do that because law enforcement didn't have any space. That was one of our hurdles. Uh, but we put the word out, and this local business stepped up and said, "We want to, we want to partner with you." Um, the goal, though, was always to move it back to law enforcement, um, and which is ultimately what we did. Um, and even though the victim advocacy community didn't necessarily agree with how we started with it, they partnered with us. They stayed with us. They were good advocates because they always wanted that program. They, they said to me directly, it's better to have a gun surrender program than not have a gun surrender program. And we can always work to our ideal. We don't have to start off perfect. We don't want progress or perfection to be the hurdle of, of progress. Uh, so they were always good partners. So uh, I, would, I would encourage you to have both of those groups as key stakeholders. Um, and and uh, uh, so that that would be my word on collaboration there. Great. Um, I want to give you another example of collaboration just to show you something that was done in another part of the country. Uh, Multnomah County, Oregon, which is where Portland is, is just a source of some great work on DV. Um, and they've used this memorandum of understanding as a way to communicate between the court the district attorney's office and the local police department on designing a method to obtain firearms with an understanding that, uh, as the purpose indicates here, the court can restrict somebody who is subject to a restraining order, and that then triggers the process of obtaining firearms and the surrender and so forth. But they have an agreement here about how they're going to function and who's going to be doing what. And this type of memorandum of understanding, something that the courts can participate in, is part of what we think is an appropriate role for judges. And I just wanted to comment for a second that Rob mentioned the importance of judicial ethics around leadership. The National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges at their annual conference in Denver next month is going to have a workshop on judicial ethics, what you can and can't do, and what you may not realize that you can do under our code of conduct. No judge wants to get in trouble but the code actually permits judges to do and engage in activities that will help uh, promote safety that, that are focused around the administration of justice. And I think Darren and Rob and I would agree this is front and center within the confines. But ensuring that you can do it within your ethical parameters is something that we will be training on so judges all have a better understanding. Thank you so much. So we have, a, we have about five minutes left, and uh, we'd like to open it up to you all again to either chat in or, um, or call or use your phone, uh, see if you have any questions or ideas, examples, comments you'd like to share with us. I see one person is typing. I, um, while um, we're waiting for that and any other comments, I just want to make sure that we do show the final slide which is a set of resources for you all. 
Um, the second resource is the National Council, and specifically the work being done around guns. Um, and Nancy Hart, who's listed there, who's listening in on the webinar today, um, is an amazing resource uh, for any of the questions you would have on topics that we've uh, covered this afternoon. So please do get in touch with us. There's a National Resource Center on Guns and Domestic Violence, organizations dedicated to uh, compiling research on the topic, and of course the Judicial Engagement Network that Judge Kanyas described below. Well, it looks like the comment was a thank you, and <laughs> thank you so much for the for the for the support. Um, it it doesn't look like anyone else is trying to call in right now uh, or or speak up. So um, unless uh, the, Judge 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 Carbon and Kanye, if you want to say a quick last word, we'll say goodbye to folks. And on, on, on my behalf, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking time out of your day to to discuss this uh, very important topic and consider us a resource. So um, we're available to you. This just touches on some of our work in this area. We'd love to be able to help you through challenges that you're facing uh, within your own communities. And this is Sue again. Um, I would also point out that Rob and uh, Judge Kindness are going to be doing, Darren and Rob, are going to be doing a workshop at annual conference as well on firearms. And as you are thinking about what you've heard this afternoon, if there are topics that you think would be helpful to have another webinar on or more specific information, let us know because we want to be a resource uh, to all of you and try to offer whatever we can to help improve practice around the country. So thank you all for being on the call this afternoon. And uh, this is Judge Rob Kanyas from Dallas again, and I want to thank you all for being on the call as well. And I mentioned at the beginning of the call that my court's been designated a domestic violence mentor court by the U.S. Department of Justice. One of the things that that means is that there's some federal grant money that comes with that. Which uh, So if, if you are interested in seeing how we operate, um, uh, either about guns or on a, bro a broader range of topics, I have money. I could have uh, judges come to Dallas or I could come to your location if you feel like that would be beneficial. But that's one of the benefits of that program. So please use all three of us as resources. And again, thank you for being on this call. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bye.